We're really proud of Star Control. But we couldn't have done it alone. So we're going to tell you a little about the people who helped us make the game. I met Errol Otis in the 10th grade at Berkeley High School, and we played D&D every day for about three years. During that time, we began making our own D&D books, and then we both moved out to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin to work at TSR Hobbies on Dungeons & Dragons. He worked here at Toys for Bob for 15 years, and he's now doing freelance illustration on Hackmasters and other paper role-playing games. His illustrations for Star Control were some of the most evocative and original. I think my favorite is the Zokpot pick. And I met Errol Otis before I came to work with Paul. He was working at a graphics company in San Rafael. He was one of the people who uh, introduced me to Paul. Errol was one of the original Dungeons & Dragons artists, and his style is unlike any of the other artists. If you mention Errol Otis to someone who played D&D back in the late 70s and early 80s, they'll know him. And I play D&D with him a few times a year, and I love it. He always wears shorts, and he owns the same car he's had for, since 1984. He has a Honda CRX. I think he's most famous in terms of his work at TSR on D&D for the cover of Deities and Demigods, and also the Cthulian illustrations that are included inside, or at least were until it was discovered that TSR did not have rights to Cthulhu. Kyle Baldo was just a teenage guy that we hired. He worked at LucasArts, and he came in to do some animation for our alien conversations. He was going to CalArts, and that's an expensive school even back then, and so he was trying to make money over the summer. At night, he would just show up at our office and do animation. Many, many years later, I was at Illuminations, the company that makes Despicable Me, and Minions, and I saw a poster for Minions, and I noticed under the director's name was Kyle Balda. I met Greg Johnson in 1984. We were both working with Electronic Arts. I was making mail-order monsters, and he was making Starflight. He has invented alternate phone ringing technology. Uh, he did Orly Draw Me a Story, in which when children draw pictures, it automatically appears in the game. He's done a TV show for Disney involving trains and hip hop. Starflight was a huge inspiration to Star Control. He tries things that no one else has ever done before. He worked with us, and he worked adjacent to us for many years on games like Toe Jam and Earl and Caveman Olympics. And Greg recently has done a Kickstarter for Toe Jam and Earl, and he's doing a FIG program for Starflight 3. Ian McKegg went to Glasgow School of Art in the late 70s, and he actually ended up doing a lot of art for early role-playing games, most famously The Cask of Souls. And his illustrations are classic, they're beautiful. And when he came to the United States, he worked at LucasArts working on games like Monkey Island. He's a very great artist. He did Darth Maul uh, in the Star Wars franchise, among many other concepts. Including Hook and Interview with a Vampire, doing both concepts as well as storyboards. So Ian McKegg wanted to help out on Star Control, but surprisingly, he didn't want to do art. He wanted to do creative writing. And when he provided us writing for the Vux, it was hand illustrated in the most beautiful calligraphy. We've still got those sheets saved. Perfectly Sorry. kerned. Perfectly kerned. <laughs> Currently, Ian is directing independent movies. The way that I ended up working with Accolade was through Shelley Day, who had been my producer of Electronic Arts and became, I believe, an executive producer at Accolade. She was the one who worked out a three-game deal for me at Accolade. Working with us after Shelley was Pam Levins, another producer. And she had worked on Star Control 1 as a lead tester and then was our producer on Star Control 2. Both extremely hardworking, extremely creative people who helped make those games into what they were. Tommy Dunbar is the lead guitarist for the Rubenews, whose hit, I think we're alone now, hit somewhere in the charts in the late 70s. I've known Tommy Dunbar for a long time because he dated my sister. And when I was looking for someone to do the music for Archon, he was the only musician I knew and I loved him. So I went and he did the initial music for Archon on his electric guitar. He later did the music for Mail Order Monsters and World Tour Golf. And then when we began Star Control, he created the music for all of what we called the victory ditties. So when one ship would defeat another, its little victory ditty would play. <laughs> Yeah.
Robert, I first met with Errol. We were all at the same company and he was an engineer and I was an engineer and he actually left the company before I did to start making games. So perhaps he led me out. Robert actually created a game called Dragon's Eye and I believe should be credited with the first use of persistent corpses in a game. I had set up a system in Star Control 1 where I could plug in ships and powers pretty quickly and I let him do the Mernherm. He did a lot of the coding on the Sega Genesis port. Um, and I think he helped on Toe Jam and Earl too, actually. Yeah. So um, he was part of the little conclave of developers we had sitting next door to each other. I met Matt Genzer in 1977. He was part of the same D&D group as Errol Otis. Together, the three of us created several fantasy role-playing game supplements, Booty and the Beasts and the Necromicon. I went on to work at TSR Hobbies, and Matt wrote for us on Star Control 2. Later on, he went to be the lead producer on Star Trek A Final Unity at Microprose. And I met Matt, you might detect a pattern here, in the same way I met Errol and Robert at the software company in the mid-80s. He, he too convinced Paul and me to work together. Something key about Matt is his last name. Genzer means goose herder. Whenever you meet him, remind him of that. I first met George Barr in the early 70s, late 60s through his artwork. I knew his artwork long before I knew him. George had been a popular science fiction artist in the 60s and 70s, and the first piece of art I owned of his was the poster for Flesh Gordon, a science fiction R plus rated movie. Robert Leyland's game, Dragon's Eye, had a cover and I recognized the artist, George Barr. And it turned out that our mutual friend, John Freeman, had met George Barr years before and used him on his games at automated simulations, games like Crush, Crumble, and Chomp. George Barr was an artist that we sought out when we were working on Star Control 2 to help us define this new pulp look, something that harkened back to the science fiction illustrations of the 30s and 40s, and yet was fresh enough to work in a modern game. You know, sometimes in business you're instructed never work with family or friends. For us, that is most definitely not the route to success. There is a certain security. You trust them and you can be a little bit more vulnerable about your creative ideas in front of them. And ultimately, I think that offers a much greater chance of you finding a great idea. In many cases, we both knew them in different venues before we had met. So they served to a large extent to connect us together and then after we were connected, we called upon them to help us with our work. And Paul and I have been friends for 29 years and we go to lunch every single day together. It's, it's not creepy, guys, I promise. <laughs> well, maybe a little. Okay.